chapters 23 and 24 are the conclusion of the uh, section of the book on the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, just a reminder about um, my understanding of the structure of the book. Uh, one to three is the call, and then four to 11 is, if you will, a kind of a summary of the situation, concluding with the picture of the defiled temple, remember in chapters uh, 9, 10, and 11, and then in 12 through 24, Jerusalem's destruction sure. And remember that throughout the book, we've been seeing this repetition, then you will know. Usually, that I am Yahweh. Um, usually in our English Bibles, our contemporary versions, then you will know that I am the Lord. I think that's a little misleading. Uh, then you will know that I'm the master. Then you'll know that I'm the boss. Then you'll know that I'm in charge. But really, it is then you will know that I am, I am. <laughs> I am the source of existence. I am the source of life. I am the basis upon which everything depends. And throughout this section, it is primarily because of the judgment that is coming, you will know that I'm Yahweh. Now then, in 25 through 32, we have the oracles against the nations. And then in 33 through 48, Jerusalem's restoration is sure. And it's interesting when you look at chapters 40 to 48, there's a kind of an interesting replay of that, where the temple is defiled, now we have a perfect temple in which perfect sacrifices are offered. So it's, it's interesting to see that uh, parallelism. Here, you will know I am Yahweh because of the restoration. I did a count last week, and by my count, this phrase occurs 73 times in the book. You might get the idea he's trying to make a point. As I've said, this is Exodus language. Ezekiel sees the return from exile as a new start. Are we going to get it right this time? And to a significant extent, they do get it right in the sense that they now are truly monotheistic. They are truly anti-idolatrous.
So to that extent, they do get it right. They also get it right in terms of the idea of becoming a royal priesthood. What does it mean to be the people of God? It means to be this royal priesthood. That's what the kingdom truly means. They also get it right in terms of the Messiah. Although, again, their ideas of the Messiah are pretty uh, uh, physical and material. Nevertheless, there is a sense in which, yes, they are ready to go on as they return from the exile. So we're looking tonight at the concluding chapters of this opening section. When the word comes that the the, excuse me, the siege of Jerusalem has started. And here then in 33, he's going to get the word that Jerusalem has fallen. In between are these oracles against the nations, which we're going to try to look at in the next weeks. And we, I hope to conclude on June 7 with chapters 30, uh, 31 and 32, and then we'll be ready in September to pick up here with the uh, happier part of the book. <coughs> As the background tells you, the siege began on January 15th, 588. That's the date that you have in verse 1 of chapter 24. The ninth year, the tenth month on the tenth day. That's January 15, 588. And it concluded two and a half years later on July 18, 586. So the fact that the city held out for two and a half years is really remarkable. Uh, the great city of Nineveh fell in three months. But Jerusalem held out for two and a half years. We can only imagine what the situation was in the city after two and a half years of siege. Famine, pestilence, cannibalism, almost unbelievable. Then the news did not reach Ezekiel that the city had fallen until six months after it happened, January 8th, 585. But it's 880 miles by road from Jerusalem to Babylon. So if you're walking, <laughs> he made it pretty fast in six months. But that was the news there. In chapter 23, we have this allegory of the two sisters. Samaria is covered in verses 1 through 11. And she is called Ohola, which is her tent. Now, whose tent we're referring to, nobody quite knows. It possibly could be just a feminine tent. But the other one, Oholiba, the meaning is pretty clear. My tent is in her. And you're clearly talking about the Lord and his tent was there in Jerusalem. We see in that 23rd chapter, Samaria is said to have committed prostitution with Assyria. And it's probable that as early as uh, maybe 880, only uh, 60 years, 50 years after the death of Solomon, the northern kingdom was making an alliance with Assyria. Then Oholiba, Judea, not only makes an alliance with Assyria, but after Assyria falls with Babylon as well. And so that's the picture that we have 
here in the uh, chapter. Now notice when the prostitution of the two sisters began. Chapter 23, verse 3, what does it tell us? It began in Egypt. Now notice the rest of the references. 23.8. What does that tell us? Didn't give it up. Continued it. In chapter 23, verse 19. She became more and more promiscuous as she recalled the days of her youth. And again in 27. I'll put a stop to the lewdness and prostitution. You began in Egypt. You will not look on these things with longing or remember Egypt anymore. What are we to make of that statement? Or that repeated statement. That heart can never be wrong with God. It kept learning what the other groups were doing instead of being clever with what they knew. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. They never really shook off the pagan worldview that they learned in Egypt. Now, clearly some people did. There were those who were righteous, there were those who were truly keeping the covenant, but for the core of the people, they never truly shook that off. Now that's not too surprising. They were in Egypt for 480 years. <laughs> 460 years, excuse me. No, 480. That's a long time <laughs> to have paganism seep into your circulatory system. Also, we've talked about this uh, numerous times, um, and there's the eraser. <clears throat> there is a lure to the pagan way of thinking. If God is truly transcendent, if he's other, then... You can't manipulate him. You can't make him bless you. You can't make him meet your needs. All you can do is trust him and surrender. Oh, that's scary. That's scary. I commit my needs to you Believing that you're going to meet them? No, 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 no. Paganism is much, much more comfortable because paganism gives us the illusion that we can manipulate the gods. We can control the forces that impinge upon our lives. I want to talk about that at the end of our session tonight, but... There it is. Paganism is always comfortable. I want a God I can control. I have regular devotions. I go to church every Sunday. I give my tithe. Okay, God, produce. That's a pagan version of Christianity. So, this pagan way of thinking, he says, got started all the way back there and was never truly broken away from, either by the northern kingdom or by the southern kingdom. And we've got 11 verses given to the northern kingdom. 
And the rest of the chapter, down through 40, verse 49, is about the southern kingdom. Now it's pretty clear that the southern kingdom thought that the northern kingdom got what was coming to them. I mean, the northern kingdom was idolatrous. They had those bull idols at Bethel in the south and at Dan in the north. They were apostate. Right from the beginning, Jeroboam the first changed the ceremonies changed the worship system. They were faithless. So, of course they got destroyed. They should have. We, on the other hand, have the right worship at the temple. We, on the other hand, have had at least six faithful kings. Every one of the kings in the north, it is said, he followed in the path of Jeroboam the first. Every one of them. But you've got six here who were good. Five of them, it is said, followed in the pathway of David. One of them, Amaziah, is said to be a good king, although he didn't quite follow in the path of David. They are faithful. According to them, so, yes, of course the northern kingdom got destroyed. They deserved it. But it's not going to happen to us. Because we have the true temple. We've had a number of faithful kings. We are faithful in terms of keeping the terms of the covenant. We have Passover in the first month, not the second month, as they did, etc. Ezekiel says, don't you believe it. Don't you believe it. Now what this speaks of is what Paul talks about. They had the form of godliness, but denying what? The power. Now, all the way through this chapter, it talks in terms of prostitution. We've talked before about this in terms of idolatry, the, the sexual orgies that were involved in much of pagan religion because the key issue, the key issue is fertility. How can I keep my land fertile? And my wife, fertile. How can I, as a woman, do the thing I do best, produce children? So that it's not merely that they were hung up on sex, but that this is the key issue where we need God's blessing. 
If my land is not fertile, if I don't get the rain, we're going to die. If we don't have children, we come to the end of our lives and it, we might as well not have lived. So, prostitution and the connection with idolatry is pretty clear. But, as you see here in that chapter, it's also foreign alliances. The north with Assyria and the south with both Assyria and Babylon. And part of this Egyptian thing is it's not merely Assyria and then Babylon. It's then Egypt. Who will deliver us from the Babylon that we made a deal with, but now seems to be swallowing us up? Now let's talk about that. Why, or let me, let me even back up farther than that. Is it appropriate to talk about foreign alliances as prostitution? If so, why? Okay, you're selling what you've got rather than doing the hard work of building up what you've got. All right, all right. What else? They put their faith in man instead of God. Okay, it is again this issue of I wonder how long we will keep the line that we have on our coins. What does it say? In God we trust. Give me a break. So that's where the issue is. And in that sense, prostitution is quite correct. I'm selling myself, I'm selling my abilities, I'm selling my goods in order to get something from somebody else. But why prostitution and not, say, marriage? A, a bad marriage. Why prostitution? All right. All right. All right. The the level of commitment. John. Yeah. 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 Yes. 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 They are married. They're married to God. So that that's, that's the line that when you trust the nations instead of your true husband, you have indeed committed prostitution. Now, does this apply to us? Should we not be in NATO? Now it's very interesting that George Washington said we should avoid entangling alliances. 
Interesting. Interesting. But what about it? How do we how do we address that question? There's always compromise when you're involved in, yeah? Number one, we're not Israel. Israel was in a special relationship with God for the sake of revelation, for the sake of the word, for the sake of the coming Messiah. So it's, it's, on a lot of issues, it's awfully important for us to remember we're not Israel. The United States is not the people of God. Now, as Christian believers, we are the people of God. We participate in the promises to Israel. But the nation of the United States does not. So, so that's, that's a sort of a bottom line place to think about here. We as a nation do not have the same covenant with Yahweh that the people of Israel had. How, a second thing I would offer here is it's a different world today than it was for Israel. We are a, a much tinier community, if you will, a much more close-knit community than was true in the case of Israel. It's a small world today, and I think it's probably impossible for us to be isolated from the rest of the world today. But, but the issue comes back down to in whom is our trust? As Christians, where is my trust? Is my trust in my bank account? Is my trust in my position? Is my trust in my nation. Where is my, my trust? Is it truly in God? And that's where I think this whole question really comes to its point with you and me. Do I truly trust God? I remember when I was in college, a friend and I had a fairly lengthy discussion about whether we should purchase life insurance or not. <laughs> he said, you're betting you're going to die. <laughs> and they're betting you're going to live. <laughs> I think the issue is not that kind of specific the issue is the deeper one, where is my trust? Am I truly trusting in the Lord and his provision in his way? I, I, I like to say this, especially talking to young people. God will probably use your talents and your abilities, your gifts, but the question is, will you wait long enough to find out how he wants to use them? Or will you simply rush ahead in your own strength, your own time, your own understanding of what's going on? And that's where, as we've talked so many times before, wait comes in. Wait. Lord, how do you want to do this? How do you want to use my abilities, my talents, my resources? There's the issue.
And that's, it's a, an almost invisible line between trusting myself and trusting the Lord. But that's, that's the issue right throughout. Um, look at verses 32, 33, and 34. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. You will drink your sister's cup, a cup large and deep. It will bring scorn and derision, for it holds so much. You'll be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, the cup of ruin and desolation, the cup of your sister Samaria. You will drink it and drain it dry and chew on its pieces and tear at your breasts. Hmm. Do you remember what Jesus said in the garden? Let this cup pass from me. What's that saying to us? The consequences of their sin. Exactly, exactly. And so what is Jesus doing? He is drinking our cup. He is drinking the cup of our consequences. Again, as I guess with almost all my original thoughts, I remember Dr. Kinlaw. <laughs> I don't remember a lot of his sermons. But this is one I remember from 1958. Yeah, before some of you here were born. Uh, and he said, many people have faced their imminent death with calmness, with fortitude, with courage. And here's this man sweating drops of blood to get out of this. What's with him? It wasn't just his death. It was the death of the whole world. It was this cup. This cup of all the sins all the horrors, all the tragedies, all the murdered children, all the raped women, all the brutal killings. And that's why he said, oh, Father, is there another way? And Father said, no, son, there isn't. Okay. Okay. Yes, yes. So in fact, what Jesus was facing was all the deaths of all the world. And it's just, it's beyond, I think, our capacity to comprehend what that meant. But I think as I read these verses, I get that picture. Filthy, horrible, bloody, ghastly. And I'm going to drink that for their sakes? Yes, Father, for their sakes, I'll drink it. Ezekiel says here, you are going to have to drink it for yourself. In, verse, in chapter 24, he said, I would have cleansed you. Talking about the pot that we'll look at in a minute. I would have cleansed you, but you would have none of it. So now, now, we're just going to have to throw the pot in the fire. That's the only way to get it clean. Mm, mm, mm. 
I would have drunk the cup for you. I have drunk the cup for you, but you would not. And so you'll have to drink it for yourselves. <laughs> Terrifying. Let's look now at verses 37 through 39. They committed adultery with their idols. They even sacrificed their children, whom they bore to me. What a powerful phrase. They're not your kids. They're God's kids loaned to you. Whom they bore to me as food for them. They have also done this to me. At the same time, they defiled my sanctuary and desecrated my Sabbath. On the very day they sacrificed their children to their idols, they entered my sanctuary and desecrated it. That is what they did in my house. What are we talking about? Here is the Kidron Valley on the east. Here is the Hinnom Valley on the west and the south. We only know the Greek name for this sort of gully, uh, the Tyropean. That has been almost completely filled in over the centuries with uh, ruins from the city on either side. Uh, this is the city of David. This is Mount Zion. This was the dump. The Greek transliterated name of it is Gay, which is valley, Henna, Hell. This is where the god Moloch was worshipped. Now, probably, well, let's do it. Probably, actually, the name of the god was King Melek. And the Bible has put in the vowels of the word shame, boshet. We don't, can't prove that, but it, it's probable. So here is Moloch down here. Up here, of course, is the temple platform. So, again, the data here is, is a bit sketchy, but, but one tradition is Molech was a bronze idol standing with arms outstretched. It was hollow, and fire was built inside it so that the thing became red hot and you laid your children in its arms.
And so you left hell and with bloody hands went up the hill to worship Yahweh. That's what the text says. Sure. Slowly and horribly. They have also done this to me. At the same time, they defiled my sanctuary and desecrated my Sabbaths. On the very day they sacrificed their children to their idols, they entered my sanctuary and desecrated it. That is what they did in my house. How do we sacrifice our children? I think we sacrifice them when we put a seven year old girl in makeup and heels. I think we sacrifice our children when we determine that our boy will be a athletic hero. I think we sacrifice our children when we determine that our child will be at the top of the class. I think we sacrifice our children when we use them for our own agenda. When the child, instead of being the one we bore to the Lord, is mine to use for my ends. And having sacrificed the kid, we go to church and praise the Lord. This thing, <laughs> I've meditated on those verses a long time. Probably from the first time I really saw them. Oh my. This they do. On the same day that they sacrifice their children, they go to my sanctuary and desecrate it. Now, they didn't intend to desecrate it. They're worshiping. They're worshiping God. Look what I've done. I've, 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 I've given my kid. God says, I never asked that. Never thought that. But that's what happens when we mix up paganism and biblical faith. When we begin trying to manipulate God for our purposes rather than giving ourselves over to God lock, stock, and barrel. At least one person here has heard me say this already. But take my life and let it be consecrated. Frances Havergal wrote that about two weeks after she was entirely sanctified. After she had made a full surrender of her life and been filled with the Holy Spirit. She was invited to a house party. She's British. And... There were going to be 10 people in this big country house. And she said she asked God, would you please give every one of them a spiritual blessing this weekend? And by Sunday night, it had happened. 
Some had been converted. Some had been sanctified. Some had made a new step in their lives. And she said, I couldn't sleep. And as I lay in my bed, these couplets, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Take my silver and my gold. Take my intellect. These couplets just came to me. Several years later, a 33-year-old blind woman who believed in Christ but was not living as a Christian heard a choir sing, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated. And she said yes. That woman's name was Fanny Crosby. And in the next 60 years, I think she lived to be 93, she wrote more than 800 songs. A blind woman. She would write them in her head and then dictate them. That's the kind of total surrender we're talking about. Not using God for my purposes but allowing God to use me for his purposes. All the difference in the world between those two. <clears throat> I'm getting carried away here. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Turning to chapter 24, we've got two parts. First of all, verses 1 through 14, where we're talking about the allegory of the pot. Back in chapter 11, they had said, the, the false teachers, Jerusalem is the pot, and we're the meat in the pot, and we're completely protected. The fire is on the outside, and all it can do is warm us up <laughs> because the pot will protect us. Now, and again, I think it's, oh, I've erased my uh, outline, but it's very interesting to me that in 11, where we've talked about the filthy temple, we've now said, yeah, but we're all going to be okay. Now in 24, we pick up that pot thing again. So what is he saying? Put on the cooking pot. Put it on and pour water into it. Put into it the pieces of meat, all the choice pieces, the leg and the shoulder. Fill it with the best of the bones. Take the pick of the flock. Pile wood beneath it for bones. Bring it to a boil. Cook the bones in it. Now the Hebrew here is very tough. And so if you look at several different translations, you'll see not a lot of variation, but some. So what's going on here? Notice verse 6. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, Woe to the city of bloodshed, to the pot now encrusted, whose deposit will not go away. Take the meat out, and I, this uh, NIV says piece by piece in whatever order it comes. I think it's dump it out. Why? For the blood she shed is in her midst. She poured it on the bare rock. She didn't pour it on the ground where the dust would cover it. And I gave you the wrong reference there. It's Leviticus 17, 14, not 7, 14. Leviticus 17, 14, which says when you kill an animal and it bleeds, you must cover the blood with dust. So the blood will not be seen because the life is in the blood. And if any blood is left in the meat, you cannot eat it. Your blood is in the midst of you. So we can't eat this meat. 
It's defiled. It's filthy. You've boiled it now till it's come off the bones. So dump it out. Leave the bones in there and burn up the bones. Wow. And the pot has this crust on it. The crust of blood, the crust of the burned bones. What are you going to do with that? Verse 10, heap on the wood, kindle the fire, cook the meat well, mixing in the spices. Let the bones be charred. Then set the empty pot on the, coal, on the coals till it becomes hot and it's copper. This says glows. Another possibility is melted. So that its impurities may be melted and its deposit burned away. Wow. You think this pot's going to protect you? No, 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 no. Your bloody meat is in that pot. And it's going to be boiled and boiled and boiled. Dumped out. And the bones burned. And the pot melted. <laughs> no, Jerusalem is not going to protect you. Jerusalem itself is going to be burned down because of the crust of sin and blood that's in it. Wow. Wow. In verse 13, I tried to cleanse you, but you wouldn't be cleansed. You won't be clean again until my wrath against you has subsided. I think that's a key point. God wants to make us clean. I've said this before. In paganism, uncleanness is the demonic, and you want to get rid of the demonic and the demon powers. In the Bible, uncleanness is simply that which is not attached to God. God wants to make us clean. He'd love to do it. But if we won't, then for these people, the only way out is judgment. O oh Lord, <laughs> O oh Lord, let me say yes when you say, I'd like to cleanse you. I want to be cleansed by grace rather than by judgment, don't you? <laughs> and the answer is absolute adherence to him. He is clean, and that which belongs to him is clean. All right. Hang on here. Now let's look at the end of the chapter. I'll confess to you, this is hard for me. <laughs> With one blow, I'm about to take away from you the delight of your eyes. And we find out who that is. It's his wife. Mm. Mm. I hope... <laughs> I hope she had been ill for some time <laughs> and that this is simply the end of that process of illness. But I don't know. Again, you and I want to be all God's as long as we retain the right to tell him how to do it. Mm. Do I really believe that he does all things well? Even something that seems to me like 
unrelieved pain. Don't lament or weep or shed any tears. And, and what the Hebrew says is, groan silently. <laughs> groan without making any noise. And I, he says, groan quietly. Some other versions say, groan inwardly. Don't mourn for the dead. Keep your turban on. Keep your hat on. Your sandals on your feet. Don't cover your mustache and beard or eat the customary food of mourners. Yes, the, the, in mourning, the Orthodox Jew takes his hat off. The only time you're in the sanctuary with your hat off. Women take their hair down. Barefoot. Your mouth covered. No, don't do any of that. So I spoke to the people in the morning, and in the evening my wife died. The next morning I did as I had been commanded. Wow, wow, yes, yes. I think about Abraham. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and sacrifice him on one of the mountains of Moriah. So, Abraham rose early the next morning and set out. Wow. Wow. So, the next morning, I did as I had been commanded. That's a man God can trust. I pray that I'm that trustworthy. I don't have to understand. All I have to do is be sure of what he's saying. Now sometimes that takes a little time. The people ask me, won't you tell us what these things have to do with us? Why are you acting like this? I mean, your wife died. Why are you going around ordinary? So I told them, I'm about to desecrate my sanctuary. The stronghold in which you take pride, the delight of your eyes, the object of your affection. Hmm. Hmm. What are you trusting in? You're trusting in the temple. The sons and daughters you left behind will fall by the sword. And you will do as I have done. You won't be able to mourn. The Babylonians will say, <laughs> get to work. <laughs> so your city got destroyed. Big deal. Produce your quota. And Ezekiel will be a sign to you. You will do just as he has done. When this happens, you will know that I am the Lord Yahweh. <coughs> on the day that I do all that, verse 26, on that day a fugitive will come to tell you the news. At that time your mouth will be opened. Remember all the way back in chapter 3, verse 26, we were told that Ezekiel is going to be mute. Evidently, the only time he spoke in that seven and a half years was when God gave him a message. The rest of the time, when that happens, your mouth will be opened and you will speak with that fugitive and be no longer silent. You will be assigned to them. They will know that I am Yahweh. Seven and a half years. 
Nothing to say because the end is for sure. Nothing to be said except the messages that the Lord gives you. But on the day when the news comes, the city has fallen. From that day on, he's going to be able to speak normally. Well, I mean, the city is destroyed. It's over. Our lives are over. Our hopes are gone. Grieve, weep, groan. No, no. Now that that city is destroyed, hope is possible and we can go forward. It's just a, a 180 degree reverse from what they were thinking. It can't happen. If it happens, everything is over. No. Until it happens, there's no way forward. Hmm. How often we get it just backwards. <laughs> How often we miss what God is really trying to do. Well, our time is gone. I wanted to talk about our idols today. Uh, I'll let you think about that for yourselves. <laughs> what is it that we trust in place of God to supply our needs? Now, again, I want to say, I'm not talking about all of us becoming monks and nuns. But the question is, am I trusting God to supply my needs through this world or am I trusting this world to supply my needs? That's the issue. According to that clock, we have one minute. <laughs> Any questions or comments you'd like to make? Yeah, I want to have sex whenever I want to, and children are not convenient. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the, the, the fascinating thing that is not said, the vast majority of those aborted children are black. But you can't say that. <laughs> yes, yes. But, but I really, in, in so many ways, when I am using my children for my ends, I'm sacrificing them to idols. When, actually before our first child Elizabeth was born, a friend of mine pointed out that the proverb says, raise up a child in its way it should go. Hebrew doesn't have a neuter pronoun. So we read it, raise up a child in his way he ought to go. And we take it for God's way. But this friend, who is a Hebrew professor, said, how about raise up a child in the child's way? As determined by God, of course. Or my way. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you for its truth. Piercing. Convicting illuminating, life-giving. Thank you, Jesus, that you have drunk our cup. Praise you. Praise you. Teach us what it means to truly give ourselves to you. 
and not demand that you explain yourself to us, but allow you to be God, trusting that you do all things well. Thank you. In your name, amen.